that is a gentleman good afternoon in last lesson we were talking about chemical bond and we saw that the covalent bond and the ionic bond we saw that in covalent bond the atoms that were involved in the formation of the chemical bond shared one or more than one couple of atoms if the two atoms were equal the sharing of the two of the couple of electrons was perfect was and the couple of electrons spent the same time over the two atoms involved in the formation of the covalent bond and the covalent bond was said to be pure covalent bond whereas when the two atoms were different from each other uh, the, the couple of electrons spent a longer time on the, on the atom that displayed a uh, higher electronegativity. And uh, uh, this gave rise, this fact gave rise to the formation of a polar covalent bond. Now, we saw that in the ionic bond, we saw this kind of chemical bond as a, a covalent bond in which the situation of difference of electronegativity between the two atoms that uh, take part in the formation of the chemical bond was extreme. In this extreme case of difference of electronegativity, the couple of electrons involved in the formation of the bond totally and um, completely <coughs> uh, transfer over the atom which has the higher electronegativity with the formation of a negatively charged particle named a negative ion and the atom who has lost the electron forms a positive ion then the ion involved in the formation of the ionic bond are held together by the uh, mutual attraction between two electrical charge of opposite side. And we also saw that uh, this kind of bond brought the formation of ionic solids because the attraction ability of one ion both negative or positive is not saturated by only one ion of opposite sign but this ion is surrounded by the highest possible number of ions of opposite charge which gives rise to the formation of a solid then today to uh, to complete the topic of the primary chemical bond we have to talk about the metallic bond well metals are solid with the exception of mercury at room temperature and they are characterized by high thermal and high electrical conductivity so the model of metallic bond must account for these two properties so metal I repeat, high thermal and high electrical conductivity. What does high thermal conductivity mean? It means that if we have a bar, a cylindric bar of, an, of a metal, as an example, a steel bar, long one meter, and uh, with the diameter of one centimeter, and one the final part of the bar is put or the bar is put on a flame and we held the bar we hold the bar with our hand after a while after a few minutes our hand with which we hold the bar will burn because the heat from the extreme of the bar which is exposed to the flame will arrive to the other extreme of the bar kept by our hand. So it means that heat propagates very fast, very quickly along the bar. High electrical conductivity means that if, for example, we have a wire of copper, 
long 10 meter, 20 meter. And the diameter of this copper wire is something like one millimeter or about this. And we operate a small difference of electrical potential at the two edge of this copper wire. We have that also with a very, very small difference of potential. Uh, electrical charge will move along this electric wire, this uh, copper wire, thus giving rise to an electrical current. You know, every other material do not exhibit such an high electric conductivity and such an high thermal conductivity. So the, the, the metallic bond the description of the metallic bond that we will give will allow to account for these two properties that no materials exhibit is such an eye, to such an high extent as metals. Well, uh, metals, we told that usually they are found at the solid states. And also metals exhibit an high coordination number, 8 or 12. I never defined the coordination number of a structure and the coordination number of a structure is the number of particles that they are immediately around one particle with whom the same particles may interact contemporaneously. And metals are usual to have high coordination numbers in practice the highest possible, which are 12 and 8. Well, let's take a metal. The metal is sodium, and sodium has Z equal to 11, and we brought the, uh, the electron structure of sodium, which is 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, 2p1, 2p2, P3, 2P5, 2P6, and 3S1. So the atoms of sodium has only one electron in their outer shell. Let's imagine that in a piece of solid of solid sodium, we have uh, a sodium atom surrounded by a high number of so the older sodium atom, which can be 8 or 12. And all these sodium atoms are very closely packed, the one close to the other. So we have that the two, the different sodium ions, they almost touch to each other, and the outer part of the sodium atom are the 3s orbital in which is located only one electron. With this description of the sodium of sodium at the solid state, it's quite easy to imagine that the energy required for the electron in, in 3s of sodium to be promoted by 3s of the atom to which it behaves to the 3s orbital of the immediately close atom of sodium, both the one which is located at his right, at his left, behind, in front of him, above or beneath. If we extend this way of thinking to all the atoms which compose the piece, the solid piece of sodium, it means that sodium is composed by sodium ions which are formed by their nucleus in which there are 11 protons and by the inner 10 electron so this is uh, these are positive ion that occupy the apexes of the polyhedra which describe the structure of solid sodium held together by the valence electron, namely the electron which are located in their outer shell, 
which are free to move in the whole piece of sodium. So this model explain very well the good properties of high, high electrical and high thermal conductivity. In fact, high electrical conductivity is explained by these electrons that are free to move in all the pieces of metal that we are considering. Namely, <coughs> the steel, the extremity of the steel bar which is put on the flame. In this, in this, in this side, the temperature of the steel bar will rise a lot. So the electron or the atom which are located at this extremity of the steel bar will have a far higher, gener higher energy than the electron located at the other extreme of the bar. So these electrons that are free to move will go from the place where there is the highest temperature, namely on the flame, to the place where is the lowest temperature, namely the extremity of the bar, the extreme of the bar, which is uh, located in the hand of the person which is held, which is holding the steel bar. Thus uh, making higher the temperature of the other extreme of steel bar. The high electrical conductivity of a copper wire is explained by the fact that the electron, the outer electron of copper are free to move under the action of a small difference of potential. These electrons are free to move. They create an ordered flow of electron and an ordered flow of the electron is nothing else than an electric current. In practice, to explain the high thermal conductivity and the high electrical conductivity, it is needed that in this material there must be some particle that is free to move and this particle must be electrically charged. In this model of the metallic bond, the particle, the, char the electrically charged particle that are free to move and are free to bear with themselves the thermal energy and the electrical energy are the electron. <clears throat> well, something else should be said about the metallic the metallic bond. From a chemical point of view, the true metals are only the alkaline metals, namely lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, and the alkaline earth metals, namely beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and another one that in this moment I cannot remember, namely Chemically speaking, the true metals are only the elements that exhibit electron, their valence electron in the S orbital. Whereas are commonly considered metals, also the transition metals. Well, uh, as the, uh, the metallic bond as a strength that is lower than ionic bond and lower than covalent bond, the true metals such as sodium, such as lithium, such as calcium, exhibit low melting temperature. As an example, the melting temperature of sodium is 98 degrees Celsius and exhibit poor mechanical properties as an example, a piece of metallic solium can be cut by using a knife. You know, the low melting temperature of sodium and the poor mechanical properties of sodium denotes that metallic bond 
is not very strong. And it is true, as covalent has a higher strength than ionic uh, bond, and ionic bond has a higher strength than metallic bond. But it must be said that some transition metals, such as iron, as an example, exhibit quite an high fusion te melting temperature, such as 1537 degree. Or, for example, platinum. Platinum exhibit a melting temperature which is higher than 2000 degree. Moreover, the mechanical properties of many transition metal, such as iron and the alloy with carbon of irony, such as steel, has very good mechanical properties. How can be it explained? It is explained by considering the fact that when we have transition metal, transition metal has an electron as a in the S orbital and also a vampired electron in D orbital. They do not have the D orbital completely filled. In this element, the bond that is created between, among the various atoms has partly the character of the metallic bond and partly the character of the covalent bond. So, the part of metallic bond is able to explain the good properties of electrical conductivity and electrical and the thermal conductivity, whereas the part of covalent bond is able to explain the high melting temperature and the good mechanical properties. Okay? <clears throat> Up to now, we have been talking about primary bond. Look at the table that I'm going to show you on the blackboard. Primary bonds are covalent, ionic, and metallic. But there are also other types of bond, which are called secondary bonds, namely the hydrogen bond, the dipole-dipole interaction, the van der Waals interaction. And these uh, uh, table is completed by an arrow which gives the growing direction of the energy, namely covalent, uh, covalent uh, uh, bond has the higher energy, then ionic bond, then metallic bond, then hydrogen bond, then dipole-dipole interaction, and still then van der Waals interaction. Well, let's see uh, the difference between, them. they are called secondary bond, not because the secondary bond are of secondary importance with respect to the primary bond. They are called secondary bonds as the strength, the energy involved in the formation and in the break, in the break up of this bond is lower than the energy involved in the primary bond but as importance, they are important in the same way as primary bond. Actually, the kind of chemical bond which is created uh, among the particles which compose a material is uh, crucial in defining the physical state, gaseous, liquid or solid, that this material exhibits. First of all, now let's see the dipole-dipole interaction. Well, I also already said that when a covalent bond is polar and the form of the molecule is not symmetrical so that the various uh, vector, the dipole moment vector become <coughs> zero, the sum of the various uh, dipole moment becoming zero, <coughs> the resulting molecule is polar. You know, a polar molecule may be represented in this way, with something that, is, that, that exhibits a positive tail, 
and a negative tail. When many of these molecules are put together, this molecule will shift or will spin or they each other so as to expose the positive tail of one dipole to the negative tail or one other dipole or, or, or one other molecule. This way, attractive interactions are created among the various molecules and the energy of the system will become lower. Well, substances such as hydrochloric acid, hydrosulfidric acid, um, methanol, methyl alcohol, are compounds in which there are dipole-dipole interaction. <clears throat> After we have seen the dipole-dipole interaction, we can explain what van der Waals interaction are. Well, molecules, perfectly polar, perfectly apolar molecules, such as the hydrogen molecules or the atom molecule of helium. Helium has a monoatomic molecule, so that it means that atom and molecule of helium are the same thing. Well, we have that also hydrogen, also helium condenses. Well, for example, it, it seems to me to remember that helium condenses at something like uh, minus 26 degrees Celsius. Well, for a gas to condense, there must be some interaction which keeps together the various molecules that compose that form the gas. And in a perfectly apolar molecule, there should not be no interaction, but it is not so. Because we told that when we have a perfectly apolar molecules, such as the molecule of hydrogen, that the couple of electrons which is shared by two hydrogen atoms is perfectly shared by the two hydrogen atoms, which means that the couple of, of electrons spend the same in average on the time spend the same time over the first atom and over the second atom. The key word is in average of time, because if we take a very short lag of time, namely one second, one tenth of a second, one hundredth of a second, in this very short lag of time, it may occur that both the electron of the that are shared by the hydrogen molecule are located both on the first atom. So, in this very short lag of time, in this instant, this hydrogen molecule will, will behave such as a dipole because over the first atom are located both the electron and it assumes a negative charge and over the other atom, over the second atom, there will be no electron and will assume a positive charge. Well, in the successive lag of time, this distribution of electron will be completely destroyed and both electron may be located over the other atom or one electron is located on one atom and one electron is located on the other atom. But in the lag of time during which both electrons are located on the same atom, this atom will assume a partially negative charge and the other atom will assume a partially positive charge. Namely, these molecule in this lag of time, in this very short lag of time, will behave as a dipole. 
it is said that this molecule may be an instantaneous dipole. The presence of an instantaneous dipole may induce the formation of instantaneous dipole in all the molecules that are located all around the same molecules. So the interaction between these instantaneous dipole may create the strength necessary to give rise to the condensation of these gases. And that's what occurs in helium or in hydrogen when they attain a temperature slightly higher than absolute zero. Okay? Well, van der Waals strength, this kind of interaction, are usually quite, can be neglected because their strength is very, very low. But if the molecule along which van der Waals strength are exerted is larger, van der Waals strength for the far interaction will, cannot be neglected anymore. As an example, suppose to have the hydrocarbon that compose gasoline. Hydrocarbons are compounds that are composed only by carbon and hydrogen, and they exhibit a perfectly apolar molecule, so that only van der Waals interaction may occur among this molecule. Gasoline is composed by hydrocarbon, which goes from 6 up to 14 carbon atoms. So this molecule will not be very small, but will not be either very large molecule. Our medium molecule, it is sufficient that this medium molecule, which has a surface which is not very small, that van der Waals interaction are able to keep gasoline at the liquid state, in the liquid state at room temperature. This is why the van der Waals interaction, the van der Waals interaction are multiplied by the surface over which they perform this action. The larger the surface, the larger the van der Waals interaction. So, <clears throat> a very small interaction multiplied by a surface which is not very small may produce a number the total value of the van der Waal interaction, which is not very small. And this van der Waal interaction may give rise to the existence of these materials in the liquid or even in the solid state. As an example, if we take hydrocarbon over 30 carbon atom, this hydrocarbon forms paraffines. paraffines is at, in the solid state. And this is why the van der Waal interaction cannot be neglected at all in this kind of quite large molecule. <clears throat> Finally, to complete the description of the various interactions that may occur among the various molecules and various atoms, we have to talk about the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is created only when the hydrogen atom, which is the smallest atom in the periodic table, the element, is bound to a very electronegative atom, such as fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So, we can see, with no doubt, that hydrogen bond is created only when hydrogen is bound to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. When hydrogen is bound to one of these atoms, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen atom share a couple of electrons. What? Being fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, more electrotin, more electronegative than hydrogen, <coughs> the, 
couple of mm, electrons will remain, will spend far more time on the more electrotive atom of fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen than on the hydrogen atom. Now, let's have, let's focus our attention over the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom is a very particular atom, which, as it is very small. It is composed by one proton and one electron. It has only one electron and is almost completely loses this electron as this electron spends the largest part of his time over the surface of the most electronegative atoms. So, <clears throat> hydrogen atom is very small. It loses almost completely its electron and becomes smaller and smaller over this small surface of this small atom is located an electrical positive chair, which is almost plus one. Being very small, the surface of the electron atom, a very large electrical positive charge density is located over this hydrogen atom. Because this electrical chair, which is almost plus one, divided by the surface, the very small surface of an hydrogen atom, which has almost deprived of its electron, will give rise to a very high number. So, this very high positive electrical density of charge located on the hydrogen atom, make sure that one hydrogen atom interacts with the oxygen, fluoride, or nitrogen atom of its molecule, but it will also interact with the oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen atom of another molecule. In this way, the hydrogen atom will be located between two different very electrotive negative atoms, thus creating a bridge between these two atoms. Actually, the exact way of defining this bond is this hydrogen bridge bond. In as much as, look at this figure, This hydrogen atom is the bridge between these two different oxygen atoms of two different water molecules. Look, the covalent bond of hydrogen with the oxygen atom of its molecule is denoted by a solid line, whereas the electrostatic interaction between the uh, positively charged electron atom with the oxygen atom of another water molecule is denoted by a dashed line and with a longer segment. And every hydrogen atom will be located between two different oxygen. So hydrogen bond may be created only in water, only in ammonia, only in hydrofluoric acid. But this gives rise to the fact that the formation of the hydrogen bond, that the heat of fusion, the heat of vaporization, the melting temperature, the, the um, vaporization temperature of these substances will be far higher than those that we expect. As an example, water has molecular weight which is 18. A similar molecule of water which exhibits about the same molecular weight is methane which has 16 as molecular weight. Well, the 
boiling temperature of water is 100 degrees, the boiling temperature of methane, at the moment I cannot remember exactly, but it is something like minus 160, minus 170. Just to say that among water molecules, hydrogen bonds are created, whereas among methane molecules, only weak van der Waals interaction may occur. We can say that if the strength of a covalent bond is 100, the strength of van der Waals interaction is 1, and the strength of hydrogen bond will be 10. Okay? <clears throat> Now, before going ahead, I would like to tell you some words about the relation that are found between the chemical bonds that are created into the various atoms or molecules that form the matter and the aggregation state of the matter itself. Let's begin from the covalent bond. We saw that when covalent bonds are formed, as an example, in the hydrogen molecule, in the oxygen molecule, in the nitrogen molecule, a gaseous compound is, is, uh, is originated. Well, it is formed a gaseous compound because when two hydrogen atoms or true oxygen atoms or two um, nitrogen atom interacts with each other, the ability of forming a chemical bond is exhausted within the molecule itself. So, when one hydrogen atom reacts with another hydrogen atom, it creates a covalent bond. Once the molecule of hydrogen is formed, this molecule of hydrogen, we cannot form anymore any other bond with the other atom. So the various molecules of hydrogen are kept together only by the weak van der Waals interaction, and this gives rise to a gaseous compound which condensates only at very, very low temperature as its molecule is very small and light. When we have covalent bonds that are created in the three different directions of the space, such as in diamond, you know, in diamond, I did not show you yet the structure of diamond, but in diamond, we have that carbon may create four covalent bonds that are directed toward the four different apexes of a tetrahedron. And so every carbon atom is located in the center of a tetrahedron, and at the apexes of this same tetrahedron, all the four carbon atoms are located. At their time, these carbon atoms that are located at the apexes of the tetrahedron will be the center of other tetrahedron. So they will create a structure that extends in the three different directions of the space. Well, diamond is solid. Diamond has very, very high, higher than 3000 degree melting point. It has very, very good, very, very high mechanical resistance. All these features are typical of materials in which very strong chemical bonds are created among the various particles that compose the solid. So what we can conclude? We can conclude that when a covalent bond, when covalent bonds are formed, if the ability of creating covalent bond is exhausted within the same molecule, a gaseous compound is formed because the gaseous molecule may interact with the other molecule only by 
van der Waal interaction if the molecule is apolar or by hydrogen bond or dipole-dipole interaction if the molecule is polar. Whereas, if the covalent bond are created in the three direction of the space, well, we have solid and are the most resistant solid with very high melting point. Then, we already said what occurs in matter when the various particles that compose matter itself are ions that are held together by ionic bond. We said that the attractive ability of this ion is not saturated by one only ion of the opposite side, but it tends to be surrounded to the highest possible number, to the as high as possible number of ions of the opposite sign, thus giving rise to solid, ionic solid. Also metals we saw that give rise always to solid materials, the exception being mercury. Because <coughs> in metals, all the atoms must be surrounded by the as high as possible number of atoms of the same. Regarding the chemical bond, one more thing should be said. Almost all the compounds that are created may be explained considering the octet rule. Namely, octet rule, what it means? It means that the atoms, when they create a chemical bond, they tend to reproduce the electron structure of the nearest inert gas, namely the inert gas that precedes or the inert, the inert gas that go after the element that we are considering. But there are also some compounds whose stability cannot be explained by the octet rule. Let's make an example. Nitrogen forms with fluorine only one compound. Let's have a look. The electron structure of nitrogen is Z7, 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, and this is the electronic symbol of nitrogen. It means that nitrogen needs three more electrons to complete is outer shell so as to mimic, so as to reproduce the electron structure of neon. Fluorine has Z equal 9, 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, and this is the electron structure of fluorine. So if fluorine puts this electron here, Another atom of fluoride puts its electron here. Another atom of fluoride puts its electron here. We have this electron structure, which is the electron structure of the combined nitrogen fluoride. And this compound comply with the octet rule. Can be explained the stability of this compound, taking into consideration the octet rule. But if we take phosphorus, which is isoelectronic with nitrogen, because it is below, it is beneath nitrogen in the periodic table of the element, also phosphorus exhibit five electrons in this outer shell. So it has the same, the same electronic symbol than nitrogen. Two electron in 3s, this one. 
one electron in Px, this one, one electron in Py, this one, one electron in Pz, this one. But we have that fluorine and phosphor form two different compounds, one with formula PF3 and one with formula PF5. The compound with formula PF3 may be explained the stability in the same way of the stability of the compound NF3, namely the phosphorus atom needs three electrons, one is brought to one fluorine atom, another one by the second fluorine atom, the third one by the third fluorine atom. So the stability of the PF3 compound is ascertained. But the stability of the compound PF5 does not. To explain the stability of this compound, we have to consider that if we give a little bit of energy to phosphorus, an electron may be promoted from the 3s2 orbital to the 3d1 orbital, thus creating five orbital in which an unpaired electron is found. Well, this phosphorus atom with this electronic structure will have the possibility to form one, two, three, four, five chemical bonds. And the stability of the compounds such as PF5 may be explained exactly in this. Now, let's go to another topic of this course. <clears throat> A last type of chemical bond may be formed between various atoms, the dating bond. Dative bond forms when an atom puts uh, one of its unpaired electron doublet in an empty orbital that is said electronic hole. Well, an example will explain very clearly in what dative bond consists. We have boron and we have <coughs> fluorine. This is uh, the electron structure of boron. This is the electron structure of fluorine. Boron has the possibility of create three chemical bonds sharing three couple of electrons with three different fluoride atoms. And this is the compound, the electronic structure of the compound. <coughs> boron fluoride, which is formed. In boron fluoride, we will have an orbital here where there are no electrons. This orbital with no electron is called an electron hole. Then, let's have a look to ammonia. Ammonia is formed by the interaction between one hydrogen atom and three, one nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atom. This is the, <coughs> the electronic symbol of nitrogen. Nitrogen will need one electron here, one electron here, one electron here, which are brought by three different hydrogen atoms. And this will be the electronic structure of ammonia. Look at this. Here we have an unpaired electron doublet. When? Well, a mo molecule of ammonia interact with molecule of boron trifluoride, this unpaired electron doublet is put in this electron hole and a dative bond is created. So it could appear as if dative bond is similar to covalent bond because both in dative bond and in covalent bond, a couple of electrons is shared. 
but they are deeply different. Because in covalent bond, the electrons that are shared, one comes from one atom and another comes, one forms another atom. Whereas in native bond, we have the both couple of electrons come from the same atom. So it means that as far smaller energy is needed to break a dative bond rather than to break a covalent bond. Because in breaking a dative bond results in molecules which have a good stability. Whereas, because they have complete outer shell or almost complete outer shell, whereas breaking a covalent bond brings to the formation of unpaired couple of electrons. So very reactive chemical species. And so the formation of this very reactive chemical species will request, will require a very high amount of energy. Well, let's go to another <coughs> chapter of this course. Now I'm going to present the various kind of chemical compound that can be found. But before presenting the various kind of chemical compound that may be found, I have to talk to tell you about a very important chemical parameter, which is the uh, which is very, very, very important from the chemical point of view. The oxygen number of an element coincides with the electrical charge that formally this element assumes. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the electronic redistribution occurring when chemical bonds are formed. Namely, when atoms interact with each other to form a chemical bond, they exchange electrons. The charge that formally this atom assumes when these chemical bonds are formed coincides with the oxidation number. Well, this uh, definition is perfect when we are talking about ionic bond. It coincides with reality, namely, when sodium and chlorine interact with each other, the electron of sodium definitely and totally will be transferred to chlorine atom so that Sodium will assume plus one oxidation number, which is equal to the charge of the ion, and the chlorine atom will transform, will turn into a negative ion, which will assume minus two, minus one uh, as electrical charge, and also minus one will be the number of the oxygen number. When we have a compound such as hydrogen chloride, the couple of electron is shared, but chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. So we will consider in computing the oxidation um, that the electron of the electron pair which is shared by the two atoms that completely transfer to the chlorine atom. Well, the rule that must be followed in the calculation of the oxidation number are the following. The oxidation number of an element is zero. The oxidation number of hydrogen is plus two if it is bound to a more electronegative element, namely a non-metal. The oxidation number of hydrogen is minus one if it is bound to a less electronegative element, namely a metal. The oxidation number of oxygen 
is minus 2, the exception being peroxide, where the oxidation number is minus 1, and fluoride of oxygen, where is, it is plus 2. Then the sum of oxidation number of a compound is 0. Finally, the sum of oxidation number of an ion is equal to the electrical charge of the ion. Now I'm going to give you some example of the calculation of the oxidation number. Then in the exercise lesson, you will calculate, you will compute the oxidation number of a lot of elements. As an example, we have that in the hydrofluoric acid, we have that hydrogen is bound to a more electronegative element such as chlorine. So, in this case, hydrogen will exhibit plus one oxidation number. And for the sum of the oxidation number of the molecule to be zero, the oxidation number of chlorine must be minus 1. As an example, we have Na2O. We have that oxygen has hydro, uh, oxidation number minus 2, so that the oxidation number of sodium will be plus 1 for the sum of the oxidation number of a chemical formula to be equal to zero. Here we have other example. As an example, look at this. We have the sulfuric acid, plus one, the hydrogen, minus two, the oxygen. We have two that multiplies plus one plus X, which has the oxidation number of sulfur, plus four oxygen atoms that multiply minus two equal to zero. In uh, solving this easy first order degree equation, we obtain that X, namely the oxidation number of sulfur is equal to plus 6. Then we have in ClO4 ion, minus 1 ion, that X, the oxidation number of chlorine, plus 4 per minus 2 is equal to minus 1. If you solve this equation, you have that x is equal to plus 7. You know, in the hydrogen peroxide, we have that the oxidation number of oxygen is minus 1. Why? Because peroxide are characterized by the presence of a OO bond. So they will share an electron pair, and an electron pair, when it's shared by two perfectly equal atoms, we consider that it gives zero to the contribution to the calculation of the oxidation number. So, zero for this, zero for this, plus one, the oxidation number of hydrogen, the consequence will be that the oxygen atom will exhibit minus one as oxidation number. <clears throat> Let's have a look to the last example. We have an hydrocarbon which exhibits formula. This is propane, C3H8. In applying, in a blind manner, the rule for the calculation of the oxidation number to carbon, 
we obtain that 3x, where x, the oxidation number of carbon, is the unknown oxidation number of carbon. We have 8 hydrogen atoms. The structure of the molecule is this one. We have that 3x plus 8, which multiplies plus 1, the result is equal to 0. By solving this simple first order degree equation, we have that x, namely the oxidation number of carbon in propane will be minus 8 thirds. Obviously, this is not possible because electron can be lost or can be uh, accepted, but they can be lost or accepted as a wall, not a fraction of electron. This apparently strange result is explained by considering that the structure of the molecule is this one. So, in this way, we have that the first carbon atom has 3 as oxidation number, which, because it creates 3 bond with hydrogen atom, the 3 electron that are shared by hydrogen with this carbon atom will be held more strongly by the carbon atom, so this carbon atom, which, which is at the beginning of the chain, will show an oxidation number, which is minus 3. Then the carbon-carbon bond that is created here, we consider that as the electron pair which is shared by these two atoms is perfectly shared. We consider as if every carbon atom keeps their own electron. So this gives no contribution to the calculation of the oxidation number. This is the reason why the second carbon atom which is located in the middle of the chain, will exhibit minus 2 as oxidation number, because it creates one chemical bond covalent with hydrogen, another covalent chemical bond with hydrogen, and two covalent chemical bond with two different carbon atoms. So these bonds do not bring any contribution to the calculation to the oxidation number, and these other two, minus one, minus one, two, cold, minus two. Then, this carbon atom, which is located on the right side of the molecule, is perfectly equal to this carbon atom located in the left land extreme of the molecule, and so, also, it will exhibit minus 3 as oxidation number. The weight average of these three carbon atoms, the first exhibit minus 3, the second minus 2, the, set, the third minus 3, is exactly minus 8 third, which is the result that we have when we, in a blind manner, we use the calculation, the, um, we use the rule for the calculation of the oxidation number in the various compound. However, when we will, will you will follow the, uh, the exercise lesson, you will calculate a lot of oxidation number in a lot of different chemical compounds. Now that we have been talking all what necessary concerning the 
oxidation number, we are able to begin to present the various chemical compounds. Let's begin starting from binary compound containing hydrogen. Well, in the binary chemical compound, the more electronegative element is written on the right, whereas the, le the less negative element is written on the left. So these compounds are compounds in which hydrogen is bound to unknown metals. For example, HCl is called hydrochloric acid, whereas HI, hydrochlor, hydro, hydro, iodinic acid, uh, H2S is the hydrosulfidric acid. You know, these are called acid because these compounds exhibit acidic. Then, hydrides of metal are ionic compound where hydrogen is present as H minus one ion. Namely, hydrogen has accepted one electron coming from an, a metal that has completely lost one or more electron, thus creating an hydride ion negative ion and, for example, a lithium positive ion. As an example, LEH is lithium hydride. CAH2 is calcium hydride. Let's see binary compound containing oxygen. Binary compound containing oxygen are called oxides. For example, CaO is calcium oxide, NH2O is sodium oxide. If there are more than one oxide, as an example, SO2 and SO3, they are called sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide, or also sulfur fourth oxide and sulfur six oxide. Four and six are the oxidation, oxidation number of sulfur respectively, respectively in sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide. As an example, another example, we have CO, which is carbon monoxide, and CO2, which is the carbon dioxide. Then we have that uh, oxygen may form with nitrogen five different compounds. N2O, which is called denitrogen oxide. NO, which is called nitrogen oxide and 2O3 denitrogen trioxide, and O2 nitrogen dioxide, and 2O5 dinitrogen pentoxide. Namely, to give a name to this compound, it must be said the name of the element and the word oxide. Then to specify the number of this element, and the number of atom oxide, we use the prefix D, 3, and so on. Let us consider the binary compounds without hydrogen and oxygen. Well, when we have a binary compound, when there is no hydrogen and no oxygen, 
always in the chemical formula. The more electronegative element is written on the right and the uh, less electronegative on the left. Well, if the difference of electronegative is large, it results in the formation of an ionic bond. If the difference of electronegative is small, as we said, it results in the formation of a polar covalent bond. As an example, we have NaCl sodium chloride ionic MgF2 magnesium fluoride, which also is ionic, and for example, PF3 phosphorus trifluoride, which is polar covalent and PF5, which is phosphorus pentafluoride, which is polar covalent. So the name of this compound is given by adding the suffix hide to the name of the non-metal element. Then when there are more than one compound that need be formed as phosphorus trifluoride and phosphorus pentafluoride, the prefix 3, 4, penta, something like this, D, may describe the, accurately the name of the compound that we are considering. Well, a difficulty might be arise in the calculation of the oxidation number of these two elements. For example, uh, in calculating the oxidation number of sodium and chlorine, or chlorine in sodium chloride, we might think that sodium chloride is formally derived from hydrochloric acid by substituting uh, sodium for hydrogen. So, as in hydrofluoric acid, chlorine has oxidation number minus one, Cl, chlorine, keeps this oxidation number also in sodium chloride. And so, uh, for chlorine having minus one x oxidation number, sodium has to have plus one as oxidation number to keep the neutrality of the compound that we are considering. Let's talk about ternary compound. Let's begin for ternary compound in which oxygen O and hydrogen H are present. The hydroxide are ionic compound where hydro the hydroxyl ion OH minus one is present to get, together with a metal ion. As an example, NaOH sodium hydroxide, CaOH2, calcium hydroxide. Well, the electron structure of uh, oxygen and hydrogen are this one. This is the electronic symbol of oxygen. This is the electronic symbol of hydrogen. So, hydrogen puts one electron here and when we obtain the OH graph there is still lacking one electron in this position. This electron is given by a metallic atom, the electron uh, reported in green and this electron which is located here gives a negative charge to the wall hydroxyl ion. So this is the electronic symbol of the hydroxyl ion. <clears throat> so the hydroxides are composed by 
the hydroxyl ion, which is this one, and by a um, uh, proper number of metallic ion whose positive charge counterbalance exactly the negative charge of the hydroxyl. Then, among the ternary compound with oxygen and hydrogen, we have the acid with oxygen, which are compound with hydrogen, oxygen, and one atom of a non-metal. Such non-metal atom is bound to one or more than one oxygen atom, which, on their turn, may be bound to one or more hydrogen atom. As an example, H2S3, which is the sulfurous acid, H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. Look at this. To give a name to this compound, you know, to have two different oxygenated atom, a compound with sulfur, H2S3, H2S4. You give the final part, the suffix of O's to the non-metal, and you call the sulfurous acid to denote the compound which has the lower amount of oxygen, namely the lower oxidation number of sulfur. Whereas, to denote the compound in which the amount of oxygen is higher and the oxidation number of sulfur is higher, we will call it sulfuric acid. And we had the final part, the suffix ic, to the name of the non-metal, and we call it sulfuric acid. It's called acid because this compound exhibits strong acidic properties. But the situation can be also more complicated. As an example, when we have an halogen, we have four different oxygenated acids, namely HClO, HClO2, HClO3, HClO4. Well, to give a name to this compound, to you take the compound that are located in the middle, which share the intermediate oxygen content and the intermediate oxidation number. And you call the one with the lower amount of oxygen and the lower oxidation number, you use the suffix os. For the higher, you use the suffix ric. So it becomes chlorous acid and chloric acid. The word acid is added because also this compound exhibit usually strong acidic properties. The other two, the extreme two, HClO and HClO4, you will always use the, the suffix os and ic, but also add the prefix ipo for the suffix os, and so you will have the hypochlorous acid, and you point with this name the compound HClO. Whereas you had the prefix hyper to the word chloric to denote the compound HClO4 to denote the compound hyperchloric acid. Okay?
Then, among the ternary compounds, we have the ternary salts. The ternary salts may be considered as derived from acids with oxygen upon the substitution of H atom with the metal atom. For example, sodium N2SO3 may be considered as formally obtained by formally substituting the hydrogen atom with the sodium atom, the hydrogen atom with the sodium atom. To give a name to this compound, we give the final part, the suffix "-ite", to the compound which exhibit the lowest oxygen content. So we have the sodium sulfite and the suffix "-eight", to the compound in which there is the higher oxygen compound and we have sodium sulfate. So we have N2SO3 sodium sulfite, N2SO4 sodium sulfate. In the case of this compound, NaClO, NaClO2, NaClO3, NaClO4, this compound may be considered as derived from HClO, HClO2, HClO3, HClO4, by the formal substitution of the hydrogen atom with the sodium atom. And to give a name, we have that we take the two middle, in which there is the middle hydrogen compound. The lower we give the suffix I, and the higher we give the suffix eight. So it becomes sodium chloride, and this becomes sodium chlorate. Then to give a name to the extreme compound, NaClO, NaClO4, we take these two compounds and we give, together with the suffix eight, we also give the prefix ipo. So NaClO becomes sodium hypochlorite and NaClO4 becomes sodium hyperchlorite. Considering the salt as derived from acid with oxygen upon formula substitution of hydrogen with metal atom and have an easy calculation of the oxidation number. Actually, in hyp hypochlorous acid, the oxidation number of chlorine will be plus one because resolving this simple first order equation X which is the oxidation number of chlorine, will result equal to plus one. Considering that in uh, uh, that in, in a compound such as NaClO, that chlorine has oxidation number plus one, can be calculated very easily that the sodium exhibit oxidation number plus one. Then, finally, we have the acid salts. The acid salts are quaternary compound in which there are four elements, one metallic, one non-metallic, hydrogen and oxygen. And in this acid soul, we have that they may they, they be considered derived from oxygenated acid, where not only the acidic function of the oxygenated atom are substituted by metal atom. As an example, when we have, look at this with for a moment, When you have sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, 
If you substitute both hydrogen atom with two sodium atom, you obtain the sodium sulfate. But if you substitute only one hydrogen atom with one sodium atom, you obtain NHSO4, which is said sodium hydrogen sulfate. To give a name to this compound, this is a sulfate, this is a sulfate of sodium, and to point with no doubt that it contains still one acidic function, we add hydrogen sulfate. So this is sodium hydrogen sulfate. As an example, we have N2HPO3, which is this sodium hydrogen sulfate, and NaH2PO4, which is a sodium dihydrogen sulfate. You know, these two compounds are derived from phosphoric acid, which is H3PO4. By substituting all the three acidic functions, you obtain Na3PO4. By substituting only one, you obtain the sodium dihydrogen sulfate. By substituting two of this one, you obtain Na2HPO. Na, uh, N2, Na2HPO4, which is the disodium hydrogen sulfate. Finally, to give a complete picture of the compound that can be formed. We have the hydrated salt. Sometime if we found some chemical formula written like this, like NaCl per 5 H2O. It means that some molecule of water find location in the empty space present in the structure composed by Na plus and Cl minus ions. These water molecules are bound to the crystal of ionic solid by dative bounds arising from the fact that the unpaired electron doublets of water, such as this one or this one, find location in the empty orbitals of Na plus and Cl minus ion. Look, if these hydrated salt are heated at temperature of about 100, 120 degrees, they reversibly lose waters and transform into NaCl and H2O. When NaCl anhydrous with no water is brought back to room temperature, it assumes again water from the atmosphere and turns into NaCl per 10 H2O, which is the stable form at room temperature. For example, when you have sodium chloride, the salt that you had to dress your vegetable when you eat vegetable, this salt is kept in a vessel with some hole through which the salt gets out to dress your salad. But usually when you upset upside down the vessel in which the salt is contained, if you, unless you put some rice in the vessel where the salt is kept, the salt will not get out. The reason is that this is an hygroscopic salt. 
the water contained into this salt may become sticky, the crystal of salt, and they will not be able to get out from the small hole that are formed in the cover of this vessel. If you put some rice within this vessel together with the salt, the rice will bring back the water from the sodium chloride. The sodium chloride will become anhydrous or less hydrated. It will be less sticky and the hydrated salt will be able to get out from the vessel in which the salt is contained. Well, I uh, presented all the kind of the chemical compound that exist. In the next lesson, we will begin to study the chemical reaction. And uh, first of all, we will see the reason why some chemical compound may react. And after we will see which are the most important kind of chemical reaction. Well, for today, that's all. We did almost two hours of lesson. Let's see next lesson. Goodbye.